Now, sticking with the Labour leadership theme, uh, we're now joined in the studio by one of the five candidates who wants to be Labour's next deputy leader, the Shadow Justice Secretary, Richard Bergen. Thank you very much. Uh, Morning, Sophie. How are you? Being with us. I'm not too bad, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm just interested, first of all, to get your analysis. We just heard from Mr Keir Starmer there about why Labour lost the election and why you lost so badly. I think we had that devastating defeat for a number of reasons, but I think the main reason was that it ended up becoming the Brexit election that Boris Johnson wanted. And in many parts of the country, the issue of Brexit ended up overshadowing traditional party loyalties. And I think that was a big difference between 2017, where we nearly won, and 2019, when we got smashed, was that Brexit came into focus, overshadowed traditional party loyalties. I think the analysis shows that we lost an equal number of votes to people who'd voted Remain, and an equal number of votes to people who voted Leave, but the disproportion, the, uh, the distribution of those votes meant that we lost over 50 parliamentary seats that voted Leave in the EU referendum. It's interesting to hear you say quite clearly you think it was Brexit, contrasting to Keir Starmer, who we've just heard from, who I, I put that to him as Shadow Brexit Secretary, and <coughs> he said that he thought that the Brexit policy was the right one going into the election, promising the second referendum, and emphasised it wasn't just Brexit that lost that election. We can just have a quick look at what he told us. He said people brought up the leadership of the Labour Party, they brought up Brexit, they thought the manifesto was overloaded, and in a number of places they brought up anti-Semitism. So there are a number of reasons. Do you agree with that from Sir Keir Starmer? Well, all of these things uh, have been mentioned, but I think some of them are linked. For example, uh, when uh, Keir says that they brought up the leadership of the Labour Party and the overloading of the manifesto, I think lots of these things came down to trust. And so in 2017, we had the same leader, uh, a manifesto of socialist policies, and we nearly won. 2019, same leader, manifesto of socialist policies, and we got smashed. Do, and you, so think, I, do you think it's more about Brexit than Keir Starmer is saying, though? I, I respectfully disagree with him on his analysis in relation to Brexit, and I think Brexit did overshadow the election. And so when people didn't trust us to deliver the policies in the manifesto, what people often say to me on the doorstep is, you couldn't even get Brexit done, and now you're promising this. So I think it went to the heart of this. And it's also why I think that the people were successful in portraying Jeremy not as an insurgent anymore, but more of an establishment figure, which he's certainly not, because people had the idea that we were somehow trying to block the will of the people in relation to the outcome of so the EU referendum. the second referendum, was that a mistake? I think it was right that we tried to bring um, the country together, but it failed, and we've got to be honest about that. That policy failed, and any idea that by being a clearly remain, which I think... Keir suggestions into I think he's mistaken as well. I think it would have been even worse if he would have tried that. Many people in the Labour Party think, and, and you know, Keir Starmer mm -hmm. reflects that a little bit, that the manifesto was a problem as well, that it wasn't credible. He wouldn't believe it. Do you accept that? No, I don't accept that. I'm proud of the manifesto uh, we stood on. I think the manifesto contains policies which contain the solutions to many of the problems faced by communities and all that diversity across the country. And what I would say is that the socialist policies in the manifesto were not the reason we lost the general election. It wasn't because of the £10 an hour minimum wage, taking rail, mail and water into public ownership, that we lost the general election. We lost the general election because it became the Brexit election I mean, some that Boris Johnson say, wanted. Some people listening to that will say, you, know, you need to get real. It was the worst defeat for 85 years. Of course the manifesto was part of it. Or, or is ideological purity coming up with the right solutions better than winning? Well, I don't think it's about ideological purity. For example, our policy on taking the railways back into public ownership was supported by over 70% uh, of win. the public. Of course, and it was a devastating defeat. As you say, the worst general uh, election result for Labour uh, since the 1930s. But we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Even in the aftermath of this devastating defeat, we can't drop our socialist policies. We can't drop our anti-austerity economics. And so that's why I'm clear that whoever's elected leader of the Labour Party, they don't have a mandate to ditch a single one of those socialist policies in the last two manifestos without the express permission of Labour members. So every single policy in the last... Manifesto should be kept. Unless the members want to ditch those policies, yes. Do you think the country really wants socialism? It just given Boris Johnson an 80 seat majority. Well, when we ask the question, does the country want socialism, let's think about what's the most popular institution in our country, the National Health Service, an example of socialist principles put into practice where public good is put before the pursuit of profit. And actually, I think. We should expand uh, those principles uh, to other areas of the economy and other areas of society as well. And that's one of the reasons I've made that 
Clause 4 pledge about public ownership and about opposition to privatisation, which I don't know we may come another, on to later. Another uh, of your uh, policies that's got a lot of pick-up is this peace pledge. Uh, now, this is the idea that Labour shouldn't support military action unless your uh, party members explicitly back it. So, for example, if, you know, a, a British embassy abroad was attacked, as we've seen in Iraq recently with the US embassy, are you really saying that the government shouldn't respond at all until you've had the chance to ballot hundreds of thousands of Labour members? The policy has been uh, misrepresented. Firstly, the policy of the peace pledge is that members would have their say if the United Nations uh, aren't backing uh, uh, the action and if it's not the case that it's a genuine national emergency. So if it's UN-backed, if it's a genuine national emergency, uh, it wouldn't apply. And we're not seeking to change the British Constitution. The Prime Minister's prerogative powers would still apply. And if MPs still really want to vote for war because they think it's the best thing to do, or if that's what they do, uh, then we can't stop them. What this is about is basically enshrining what happened when it came to David Cameron's proposal to vote uh, to bomb Syria uh, in 2015. Jeremy held a ballot of Labour members online over, I think, a 48-hour period. Over 70% of Labour members voted to say they opposed David Cameron's plan to bomb Syria. And members of Parliament, Labour members of Parliament, reflected upon that. And in the end, the majority of Labour MPs voted against supporting David Cameron's plan to bomb Syria. If that happened in relation to Syria, then I think that should happen all the time, apart from under the exceptions uh, that I've just outlined. At the same time, though, most of the time when military action is considered, it is a national emergency, isn't it? Uh, Iraq wasn't a national emergency. Our intervention in Libya wasn't a national emergency. Uh, our intervention in Afghanistan wasn't a national emergency. For half of my uh, life, so for all of my adult life, we've been involved in wars in the Middle East. And I think it does shame the Labour Party that we were so associated with those interventions. Uh, Iraq was a disaster, Afghanistan was a disaster, uh, Libya uh, was a disaster. And I think it's right that Labour members should be allowed to have a say on what the Labour Party's position is. The Labour Party is distinct from the position of Parliament or individual MPs. If you're a Labour government, though, which is surely the aim, mm. shouldn't you be representing everybody, not just Labour members? Why should it be Labour members alone who are getting to decide policy like this? Well, it's Parliament that would decide whether a country goes to war or not, and the Prime Minister would still have prerogative powers, and MPs wouldn't have to vote in the way that the party wants them to do. In all political parties, MPs sometimes vote contrary to the wishes uh, of their MPs, and, of course, there are political consequences to that for them uh, quite often. All I am saying is that never again should Labour members have to protest, not in our name, against their own government, as I did when I uh, protested against the Iraq war. The reality is, um, when we get away from th the rest of it, uh, some of the things that have been said about this uh, policy, Labour members should have the right to express their opinion on what the party's position should be on the most serious thing a political party can do, either support military action or oppose military action. Um, quickly, you told HuffPost this weekend um, that if Jeremy Corbyn was shadow foreign secretary, that would be ideal. So would you like the contenders for the leadership to be considering giving him that job and their shadow cabinets? Well, I think that if they become leader, they should uh, consider all the options. I, uh, the point I was making in the interview is that Jeremy Corbyn has made a fantastic contribution to socialist politics in our country. Uh, he's made many gains in the Labour Party. He's made as an anti-austerity party, a democratic members-led party, so an anti-war anti internationalist party. I think that he'd do a great job. Uh, as, but the point I was making in the interview is that it's not the end for Jeremy Corbyn. He's got a long political career ahead of him, should he wish. He's 10 years younger nearly than Bernie Sanders, who also has a, a big political career ahead of him. Okay. So I'm sure whatever Jeremy wants to do, he's got a big contribution to make to our party. OK, now, you are own, one of only two candidates to not sign up to 10 pledges mm. uh, put forward by the Jewish Board of Deputies, mm. saying they would like all the candidates to sign up to them. Now, we can just see them here on the wall. I mean, there's, there's a few of them. Um, what don't you agree with here? Clause 8, for example. I mean, just to say, I think it's very important that we do work with the Board of Deputies to fight anti-Semitism on a whole host of other issues. Uh, in relation to um, the Eighth Pledge, that does concern me because it talks about fringe Jewish groups. Uh, and I want to work with groups right across the Jewish community. 
uh, not just with the Board of Deputies. So, for example, as a constituency MP, it would be seen as very strange if I were to say, I'm only going to work with this Kurdish community group, but not that Kurdish community group. I'm only going to work with this Nigerian community group, but not the other Nigerian community group. So do you, do you think you know better then than the Board of Deputies on how to deal with anti-Semitism? No, no, of course not. And that's why it's important that we work with the Board of Deputies on fighting anti-Semitism. But when it comes to this idea that as a non-Jewish person, I should be signing up to something which declares other Jewish groups as fringe groups, like... The Haredi Jewish community, are they a fringe group? The LGBT Jewish community, the socialist engaging, uh, Jewish group? Engaging with the main Jewish groups doesn't stop you talking with others, though, does it? Well, some people uh, don't want us to talk with what they call fringe Jewish groups. I'm not prepared to uh, accept that pledge. They're not going to ban you from talking to other groups, though, are they? I think it's important we engage with groups right across the Jewish community. It doesn't mean we agree with everything they say. But I think it is very important that the Board of Deputies is obviously a very important group. We need to listen to them. We need to work with them. But we can't work and listen exclusively to them. We need to work and listen right across the Jewish community. And that's one of the reasons that I wouldn't sign the 10 pledges. I mean, most of the pledges uh, I uh, agree with. Also, the outsourcing of uh, the disciplinary process. We need more detail on that. I'm yet to be aware of any organisation that successfully outsourced their disciplinary uh, process. In, um, in 2014, you said Zionism is the enemy of peace. Given that, given your concern with these pledges, are you not worried that some people will think you're not committed to tackling anti-Semitism within the Labour Party? Of course I'm committed to tackling anti-Semitism in the Labour Party and in wider society. One anti-Semite in the Labour Party is one anti-Semite uh, too many. So why don't you just sign up to the pledges? Why is it that you know, you've said these comments in the past that has worried the Jewish community? Well, I said I made those comments before becoming uh, an MP and I've explained in detail, I wouldn't use that phrase now because it's a crude oversimplification, because the phrase Zionist doesn't just mean uh, Netanyahu and his government. Uh, you know, I've met uh, peace campaigners who want, like the Labour Party does, who want, like I do, a two-state outcome, uh, who class themselves as Zionists because they believe in a state uh, of Israel. So it was a, a crude phrase I used before I was an MP that I wouldn't use okay. now. But the reasons I haven't signed uh, the pledges, you know, I've made clear, I think it's important I'm open and transparent uh, about that. OK, now, just to end, we did this with uh, some of the other uh, deputy leadership candidates we had on the programme before as well. I'd like to end with a quick, quick file, just get getting to know you. Who do you think is the best leader in the Labour Party's history? I think Keir Hard is the best leader in the Labour Party's history because he founded uh, our Labour Party. He was an anti-war internationalist, a socialist and anti-racist. Who did more for working class people, Jeremy Corbyn or Tony Blair? I think it's not about individuals, the whole Labour movement uh, delivered. Dream shadow cabinet job? Uh, shadow foreign secretary. Favourite band? Iron Maiden. Ever kissed a Tory? Not that I'm aware of. OK, Richard Bergen, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thanks. Thank you.